This is not going to be a review of City Skylines, of the City Skylines Industries expansion, or of any of the game's other expansions. If you're interested in reviews, I've written reviews for the Industries expansion and for City Skylines and all of its other major expansions on my personal blog. I invite you to check those out if you're interested. That being said, I did make a lot of observations and points in my Industries review, which I am going to be repeating in this analysis because I feel like they are representative of some unfortunate trends that I've been seeing in the game with its more recent expansions. This video is going to be critical of City Skylines, but I do want to start out by emphasizing that I love City Skylines. You don't put over 700 hours into a game if you don't like it. I mean, I, at least I definitely hope that nobody's doing that to themselves. Poor bastards. City Skylines is, without a doubt, in my mind anyway, the single best city builder that's come out since SimCity 4, which released all the way back in 2003, over 15 years ago, as of the time of this recording. My goodness, I'm getting old. When I watched the first trailer for City Skylines, in which a player is apparently custom building freeway ramps and interchanges from scratch, I was sold on this game. After years of having to use boring, prefabricated stock on ramps and interchanges, the little civil engineer within me practically jizzed in his pants at the idea of being able to build my own highway ramps and interchanges, and there was no looking back. City Skylines has gloriously succeeded, where other recent games like 2013 SimCity or Cities XL and its various sequels and updates have miserably failed. Skylines picks up the mantle of those great SimCity games of yesterdecade, and brings it into the 21st century with deep simulation based on agents and pathfinding, a sleek and modern UI, extensive customizability and modability, and an attractive 3D graphics engine. It's made all the more impressive by the fact that the game's developer, Colossal Order, is a small, independent studio that had something like nine people working for it when the game initially launched. And yet, a company with all of the manpower and resources of Electronic Arts only managed to squeeze out a flop like SimCity 2013? I could probably go on for hours about all the things that I like about City Skylines. And maybe at some point I will. But that's not why I'm here today. I do invite you to check out my personal blog to read up on what I like about the game and its various expansions. I could probably also talk for hours about the things that I'd like to see added or changed about City Skylines, but again, that's not exactly why I'm here right now. And again, I invite you to check out my blog because it also contains wish lists. Something that I'm probably going to have to repeat many times in almost every video that I create is that it is very important to recognize that we can love something and still be critical of it and capable of recognizing its faults recognizing and then correcting those faults is how the things that we love get better. So, in the spirit of taking a critical look at something that I love, in the hopes that it can be further improved, I want to pose a question. Is the modular nature of its expansions actually hurting City Skylines as a game? Colossal Order has been popping out expansions for City Skylines at the rapid pace of two per year since the game's release back in 2015. And that's not even including other content packs like the match day, concerts, various themed building packs, and the various radio stations. That's a lot of content. I guess it is one way of keeping your game relevant, as it has caused me to consistently revisit the game a couple of times per year. Maybe Colossal Order also has some business reasons why they've chosen this particular model of content scheduling. I don't know. I'm not a business analyst. I don't know anything about the company's finances. I'm just an amateur games critic with a very amateurish blog and a YouTube channel. But this particular release model does pose some problems for the game and its players. The limited development time means that the content that is provided in these expansions is also necessarily limited and they very rarely ever feel as robust or comprehensive as they could be, or at least as I would like for them to be. 
Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just asking for too much. But I definitely feel like I personally am getting diminishing returns from each new expansion that comes out. Part of that is that there's already a lot of content in this game and a lot of expansions. And so each successive expansion feels like a relatively small drop of metaphorical water into an already large metaphorical bucket. In addition to this feeling of diminishing returns, I've also found each expansion to have some glaring weaknesses or omissions that bothered me, and which never get resolved by later updates or expansions. For example, After Dark added the day and night cycle, but that cycle did not follow the same rhythm as the actual calendar days or months in the game, which created this weird disconnect between a day within the game's simulation and economy and the days, weeks, months, and years of the little calendar ticking away in the bottom left corner. Furthermore, the day-night cycle has never really felt as meaningful as it should. It affects your leisure and your tourism districts. However, schools, for whatever reason, stay open all night, city lights don't seem to demand any additional power from your power plants, and people continue to commute to and from work all throughout the night, which all makes the day-night budget sliders feel pointless. I mean, honestly, how often do you ever adjust your daytime and nighttime budget for any of these things differently from one another? And don't you wish that there was a slider that would just move both of them at the same time? After Dark also added a lot of ploppable coastal buildings like piers and beach volleyball courts, but it failed to include any kind of public beach, either as a zonable, or as a specialty district, or as some kind of coastal ploppable, like a park. SimCity 4 had beaches, why not skylines? Following After Dark, I really expected the next expansion to add some kind of seasonal cycle to complement, or possibly further confound, the day-night cycle that was added by After Dark. I was hoping to see the public beaches that were absent from After Dark, as well as things like ski resorts and other winter-themed activities. I got half of my wish. The second expansion was, of course, Snowfall, which added winter-themed cities, but which did not include an actual season cycle. Winter cities are stuck in this perpetual purgatorial winter, and your non-winter cities are stuck in perpetual summer such that you have to start an entirely new city on an entirely new map if you want to see and play with the Snowfall content. None of the Snowfall-specific mechanics, such as the gas utility, boilers, snow plowing, the thermometer, or any of the associated policies, are even utilized in non-Snowfall maps, yet that little thermometer is still there in the UI, and all those policies are still available, taunting me with their complete pointlessness. To make matters worse, this expansion completely dropped the ball with regard to how some winter-specific activities, like ski resorts, even work. The ski resort is just a ploppable artificial ramp that you can put on any flat terrain. It doesn't have to go on a natural incline, nor does its elevation even matter. Instead of building an alpine ski resort town tucked away at the foot of a mountain, you could build your ski resort on completely flat land. Even though the core Skylines game does such a good job of utilizing the underlying terrain to help shape your city and give it a little personality, the Snowfall expansion made the underlying terrain completely irrelevant to these new features. It just completely whiffed. I think the next expansion might actually be the most underrated City Skylines expansion. Believe it or not, I actually think that Natural Disasters might very well be the most complete, robust, and well-rounded expansion for the game so far, not to mention the most novel. Disasters have been a feature of almost every city builder since the original SimCity, but Skylines is the first game, at least the first one that I'm aware of, that actually tries to systemize the ideas of disaster detection, prevention, and recovery, as well as to build a set of mechanics around those systems. Warning! Experts predict an earthquake could hit the area soon. It's also the only expansion that actually added any real challenge to City Skylines, which admittedly is a game that has always been on the easy side as far as a game goes. But even though I was really impressed by the depth and detail of this expansion, 
even it has some shortcomings. For one thing, the disasters are completely random. There's no climate or weather models or seasonal cycles that allow you to predict the frequency or intensity of storms, nor are there geologic models that tell you if you're particularly susceptible to earthquakes or tsunami, like, you know, having fault lines or something like that as a feature of the map, or anything like that. They also didn't bother to add any winter-specific disasters, like blizzards or hard freezes, for those of us who owned Snowfall, because apparently Skylines is going to set this trend where Snowfall is the black sheep of the expansion library, and no future expansion seems to want to acknowledge that Snowfall ever even existed, which is a shame, because Snowfall is the one expansion that I most want to see further expanded. Next up came Mass Transit which was probably the most utilitarian of the Skylines expansions to date. It brought us some new transit options and road types to help alleviate traffic congestion, including the addition of the long overdue passenger ferries. However, this expansion neglected to revise things like the cargo harbor mechanics so that we could actually create freight barge routes or make the placement of cargo harbors a little less painfully restrictive in general. Mass Transit also neglected any kind of water-based city services, like a Coast Guard or something like that. This combination of the harbor and service emission meant that, despite the addition of passenger ferries, a true island economy is still impossible without building a network of bridges for freight and emergency services. Then we move on to Green Cities, which I think probably competes with Snowfall for the worst expansion, but probably takes the cake due to just how overall lazy and dull it is, at least in my opinion. Green cities focused on pollution management and ecological sustainability, but it didn't bother to make pollution any more relevant or any more challenging to begin with. It also added a new local produce specialty commercial district, which, frustratingly, doesn't require any actual local agriculture nor are there any synergistic bonuses for connecting local agriculture industry to the local produce commerce. This expansion pretty much only served to take something that was a minor inconvenience, which was the pollution, and give you the tools to make it a complete non-factor. Maybe this expansion is more useful and necessary for people who get their cities up over a million population, but to be perfectly honest, I rarely ever play the same city long enough to make that happen. So maybe my dislike for this expansion is just me. Actual results may vary. Then we have Park Life, which is easily the most expressive of all the expansions to date. This expansion added a totally new park area mechanic that allows you to paint an area as a park, similar to a district, and then fill it with modular components and decorative props in order to attract visitors. However, for some reason, maybe to support legacy save files, I don't know, Colossal Order did not bother to incorporate the legacy park ploppables into this mechanic. So all of your existing parks, playgrounds, plazas, tennis courts, volleyball courts, riding stables, marinas, and so forth cannot be placed as modular components within a park. They still need to be attached to a road. If you do place these structures on a road within a park district, they do count towards the entertainment value of the park, so they're not completely ignored in that sense. Also, to be perfectly fair, there was a mod available on day one that allowed players to place park ploppables as modular park components that didn't have to be connected to the roads. Of course, enabling such a mod would disable achievements and other in-game rewards, so... Eh... And besides, I really don't feel like we should have needed a mod for that kind of functionality. It should have been put into the game by Colossal Order to begin with. Oh, also, Park Life didn't modify the camera so that you could actually zoom in close enough to, you know, get a good look at all the pretty decorations that you've been putting around. In fact, I find it really hard to even tell what some of these decorations are, or if they're facing in the right direction. Look at this little telescope. Is it actually looking out onto the city like I want it to, or is it facing backwards towards the trail and all the people walking around it? Now here we are with the final expansion, as of the time of this recording, the Industries expansion. Industries basically just takes the mechanics introduced in Park Life and 
ports them over to create industrial parks, as well as adding some supply chain and logistical concepts. Industries repeats the same mistake of park life by not incorporating any of the legacy industries into the new industry mechanics. None of your zoned industries, at least as far as I've seen, contribute materials towards your industrial areas, processing buildings, or special factories, even though those zoned industries still consume the underlying resources, in the case of ore and oil. Colossal Order also did not bother to introduce any new industry types. At least Park Life was good enough to add the nature preserves and amusement parks, both of which were wholly new to the series. Industries, however, just gives us ploppable duplicates of the zonable agriculture, forestry, mining, and drilling industries that we've already had since day one. The most obvious new industry that I could think of would be some kind of fishing or aquaculture industry. The lack of such an industry is odd because I've actually seen some maps that seem to highlight fertile soil over water, yet there's no water-based agricultural ploppables of any kind, so what, are they expecting me to just drain the river and build a farm over this? I don't, I don't know. Colossal Order also did not incorporate the leisure or tourism specialties into the industry mechanics such that they level up like the other industrial parks. This might be a pretty esoteric complaint on my part because I live in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, whose principal industries are leisure and tourism. So the fact that neither is considered a quote-unquote industry in this game seems odd to me. But that might just be me. Maybe if you don't live in Las Vegas or LA or New York or Paris, you don't think of tourism as an industry either. But then there's also more that the industry's expansion dropped the ball on. The new industry supply chains means that shitloads of freight trucks are always being spawned, which clog up your roads and create a lot of congestion. On the one hand, this is a nice new challenge to have to manage, and you know it would be hypocritical of me to complain about the game being too easy, and then also complain about a feature that adds some challenge to the game. On the other hand, however, this new challenge feels kind of arbitrary and unfair because Colossal Order didn't bother to implement some basic logistical infrastructure that would help us alleviate this problem. Put simply, there are no new non-truck options for dealing with freight. This was another prime opportunity to revamp the ways that cargo harbors work since mass transit didn't bother, but industries couldn't be bothered with that either, so we can't ship freight by barge up rivers or around land features or anything like that. Yeah, sure, cargo trains can help, and there's a new cargo airport with the built-in train connection, but there's no new routing options for getting raw materials to processing facilities, even though some common sense ones do exist in real life and probably could have been easily modeled in this game. The most obvious would be a pipeline for oil. Or how about being able to float logs down a river, a practice which is still in use today. Or what about being able to build a handcart or minecart path for moving ore from the mine to the sifter instead of having to load it onto trucks? Or how about a series of livestock paths or stock routes to move livestock from a pasture to a butchery or a meat processing plant, again, instead of having to load them up onto trucks? Why aren't any of these concepts in this game? Why does everything have to be shipped by truck? And now, a new expansion pack was just announced while I was producing and editing this video. City Skylines Campus will probably be available on Steam by the time you're watching this. Uh, hopefully it's not already out by the time I'm releasing this, but we'll see how it goes. Campus looks to basically take the park life and industries area mechanics and further extend them to apply to university campuses, complete with varsity sports. Will this expansion's features replace the existing legacy university buildings and mechanics? Will those legacy universities be converted into something more akin to community colleges that don't require large sprawling campuses? 
Will those legacy buildings work in conjunction with the new campus areas and infrastructure, or are we going to have two fundamentally different types of universities that are both in the game at the same time, have similar functions, but completely disjoint mechanics? Furthermore, will the new stadiums and varsity sports replace or extend the functionality of the match day stadiums? Or are the match day stadiums going to remain exactly as they are, and we're just going to get deeper, more robust features for managing the college stadiums? Eh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Stay tuned for a full review on my blog, hopefully within a few weeks of campus's release on May 21st. Now, of course, I don't want you to get the impression that I think all of these expansions are terrible. Well, uh, except maybe for Snowfall and Green Cities. Most of them are pretty good, and add a lot of pretty good content. Again, you can check out my reviews to, to see specifically what I feel about each one individually. However, every single one of them has these seemingly obvious shortcomings in their design and execution. I definitely do not think that Colossal Order lacks the talent or creative vision to make these expansions great. The base game by itself is a testament to the talent and creative vision of Colossal Order. Maybe a part of the problem is that Colossal Order is a relatively small team, so they are admittedly limited in how much people power they have available to make these extensive changes that redesign the core gameplay experience. Or maybe they just aren't giving themselves enough time to let these ideas fully bake before they stamp it and ship it out to the public. I don't know. In any case, the rapid pace of release, the limited scope, and the modular nature of each of these expansions is starting to have a tangible effect on the game. A game that used to feel very uniform and cohesive is now beginning to feel mechanically disjoint and bloated. New features and ideas keep getting piled on top of one another, with little or no concern for how they interact with the existing mechanics, or how they might interact with future mechanics. For example, we now have two sets of parks with overlapping functionality but completely disparate behaviors, as well as two different sets of industries, also with overlapping functionality but completely disparate behavior. We have a day-night cycle in which schools stay in session at night because that day-night cycle is completely independent of the routines and cycles of the citizens' days, which are, as far as I can tell, completely independent from the in-game calendar days, which act more like hours or minutes in the scope of the game's world. We have two separate recycling policies, only one of which actually ties into the Recycling Center building, because Colossal Order, for whatever reason, didn't want to just replace the old recycling policy. We have a locally sourced produce policy that does not depend on producing produce locally. We have ferries that can transport citizens across water, up rivers, or through canals, but we can't ship industrial materials or products along those same routes. We have seasonal maps, but not seasonal transitions. I mean, heck, Snowfall is so modular and segregated from the rest of the game that you literally have to load up an entirely new subset of maps just to be able to play with it. Within the set of modular Skylines expansions, Snowfall is practically a spin-off game. We have weather effects, disasters, and water management infrastructure, such as canals, keys, and flood walls. But heavy rains don't lead to flash floods or rising river or lake levels, and so there's no need to actually build that water management infrastructure unless it's part of the aesthetic that you want your city to have. Even though you do have to build other disaster prevention and mitigation infrastructure for the disasters that are included in the game. And as an aside, it isn't just coastal cities having to deal with rising ocean levels caused by anthropomorphic climate change. Make no mistake, managing floodwaters during monsoon seasons is something that many real-life cities near rivers or within marshes or lowlands or floodplains have to do. There's a growing practice around the world of shifting from artificial concrete barriers to hold back rising waters and towards using large stretches of natural green spaces and wetlands to absorb the water, which then hopefully goes back into the water table where it can actually be used, with the added effect of beautifying the city. Win-win-win, right? Real cities do this, but we don't have to worry about it in skylines because rain never raises water levels. There's just the tsunami event, and that's only on certain types of maps. 
These mechanics, infrastructure, and policies that feel like they should obviously be connected or related and should feed into each other simply aren't and don't. This is actually the same problem, though to a lesser extent, that I already discussed in my previous video about electronic arts design philosophy regarding its Madden NFL football games. EA and Tiburon keep throwing in new mechanics without regard for how they influence the rest of the game experience. At least Colossal Order hasn't started cutting out popular mechanics the way that EA has done with Madden, or the way that Skyline's publisher Paradox has done with other games like Stellaris. Compare City Skyline's expansion design philosophy to one of my other favorite PC game franchises, Sid Meier's Civilization. The approach that Firaxis takes to its Civilization games and expansions has always been to release fewer expansions, but for those expansions to try to change the way that the game is played. They revise the way that multiple game systems work, in order to facilitate the new features that they want to add or change. And if they remove anything, it's almost always because they're replacing it with a more robust and engaging mechanic instead. Hopefully. Perhaps the most dramatic example of this is Civilization V's second expansion called Brave New World. That expansion stripped out what few lackluster abstract trade route mechanics existed in the vanilla game and replaced them with a whole new mechanic in which trader units, the caravans and cargo ships, would actually travel from one city to another, generating wealth and other resources for both cities, while also being subject to potential plunder from enemy factions or barbarians. That same expansion also completely redesigned the cultural victory, which had been a staple in the series since Civilization III, and that culture victory was redesigned from the ground up. The original culture victory in Civ V required the player to spend accumulated culture in order to buy all of the policies in five different policy trees. The process was rather passive and not at all engaging. Brave New World shook this victory condition to the core by adding a whole new system of great works and archaeology in which great people that you had earned over the course of the game could create works of literature, art, or music that could be displayed or performed in your city's libraries, museums, or opera houses, respectively. Further, towards the end of the game, you could unlock archaeologists, who could uncover artifacts from previous events in the game and display them in your history museums. Related works and artifacts could be grouped together to create a themed museum for even greater reward, which gave you a reason to trade those great works with the other civilizations in the game. That old, passive system of accumulating policies was replaced with an active, engaging system of populating museums and libraries with themed works, and of callbacks to previous events in the game. Again, I want to emphasize, one of the victory conditions of the game was fundamentally changed in an expansion. Those expansion mechanics, the trade routes and the great works, were so well received by the Civilization community and critics that both mechanics were ported almost verbatim into the vanilla release of the sequel, Civilization VI. Civilization VI itself has also seen expansions on the market that changed the core Civ VI experience. The first expansion, Rise and Fall, added little ambient quests that the player could accomplish in order to accumulate points towards a Golden Age or a Dark Age. This mechanic provides incentives for players to expand their influence, and sometimes even to play outside of their usual comfort zones. And it makes competing for rare things, such as building wonders of the world or settling near natural wonders, more attractive. In order to accomplish this, Firaxis had to redesign the way that the game's eras work, and they supplemented these eras with a new loyalty mechanic that made the player have to be much more thoughtful regarding where you settle or what cities you conquer, and it dramatically changed the way that players play the militaristic domination victory. The second expansion, Gathering Storm, added weather events and disasters and a global warming mechanic that actually causes coastal cities to flood, making them less productive and potentially killing population, which again changes the way that you settle cities. It also completely redesigned things like the strategic resource system and, and added an entirely new diplomatic currency that can be used for trade. Between two expansions for Civ V, Virtually every system in the game had been tweaked, redesigned, or completely replaced. And Civ 6's two expansions, as of the time of this recording, 
also changed or tweaked numerous game systems in order to supplement its new features. City Skylines doesn't really do this with its expansions. Rather than tweaking or redesigning multiple concepts within the game, each expansion is relatively self-contained and only adds new mechanics or systems on top of what already exists. In fact, I'm struggling to think of any one core mechanic that has been significantly changed since the game's vanilla launch. Maybe the day-night cycle? Or maybe the free terraforming DLC? Ugh. Colossal Order never seems to be thinking about changing the way that players actually play the game. They're just giving us more tools to play with and express ourselves. After buying any given expansion, you can almost always just continue to play the game exactly as you had played it before, because few, if any, of those existing systems had changed at all. Sure, the new tools might have ripple effects on other systems in the game, but you can always fall back on tried and true methods and strategies. Admittedly, some of these concessions are probably done in order to preserve backwards compatibility with save files. After spending tens of hours building the perfect city, I'm sure the last thing that most players would want is for some new expansion to break their old cities that they worked so hard to construct and perfect. And that's a perfectly valid concern, and Colossal Order should be taking that uh, into mind when they develop their expansions. In fact, City Skylines publisher Paradox is notorious in this regard with the games that it does develop, such as Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis or Stellaris. That is why some games, including the aforementioned Civilization VI, allow the player to revert to pre-expansion rules if you wish to continue playing a save game from before the expansion. That probably should not be necessary for Skylines because of how sandboxy its design philosophy is, and I'm not asking for old buildings and zones to stop working, only that the new buildings and zones are unified with the old ones. For example, the Industries expansion should not have broken existing industrial zones such that your whole city's economy collapses the moment you load up the game after installing the expansion. But those old industrial zones should have been modified to work with the new industrial areas and buildings. They should have been modified so that they actually produce the materials and resources that your advanced factories need. Similarly, old parks should not have stopped working after installing the Park Life expansion. Instead, they should have been rolled in with the new park mechanics such that they also can be modularly placed in the park areas along paths or out in the middle of nowhere like all of the new park ploppables and decorations. Existing cargo harbors should not have stopped working after installing mass transit or industries but Colossal Order should have added the ability to chain harbors together to create shipping routes that go up rivers or around islands, just like what you can do with the ferry routes. And yeah, would it have killed Colossal Order to throw in a blizzard disaster or hard freeze event into natural disasters that would have applied to snowfall maps, or made it so that the ski resorts are built up on the mountains and not on flat land, or made a beach park area, or changed up the economic model so that schools and government offices close down at night? Is it too late to hope for an expansion that unifies snowfall with the rest of the game by adding an actual seasonal cycle with season-appropriate weather and disasters, peak tourism seasons, kids going on summer vacation, and so forth? I certainly hope that this company is financially stable enough to be able to go more than just six months without selling an expansion or DLC and not go under or be forced to lay off staff. That'd be terrible. They make a great product, and I hope they continue going on to make great products. But I feel like their current trend in quality is a slightly downwards one. Is it really too much to ask for Colossal Order to take its time with the next expansion, assuming that there will be a next expansion, so that that expansion can be more comprehensive and robust, and for it to maybe, I don't know, fit in better with the rest of the game? Or is that something that I'm going to have to wait for City Skylines 2? <sighs> well, I hope that the cynicism and negativity of this rant did not make you think that City Skylines is a bad game. Despite all of the criticism that I've levied against it this past half an hour or so, I do still love this game. It's the single best city builder since SimCity 4, and I've put literally hundreds of hours into it. 
but I have to admit that the time that I spend with the game has tapered off in the last year or so. I'm finding myself spending less and less time with each new expansion, and I keep walking out of them feeling not quite satisfied. But if you're on the fence about purchasing Skylines or any of its expansions, then I highly recommend that you give the game a try. It took me 700 plus hours with the game to start getting this jaded, so that's still a really good value for the money. If you're looking for specific expansions, then I personally would recommend Mass Transit, Natural Disasters, and Park Life. I think those ones are the best ones so far, and I would say that you could probably avoid Snowfall unless you really like building cities in snow. If you'd like to see more of my content, then I invite you to check out my personal blog at www.megabearsfan.net. It includes reviews and wish lists for City Skylines, as well as many other games. If you'd like to see more video content like this, then I also invite you to check out my Patreon page. With your support, I'll be able to maintain the megabearsfan.net domain and servers, and can hopefully create more, better produced videos like this. In addition, as I reach my goals, I plan on making a matching contribution to a charity or nonprofit. The specific charities or nonprofits have yet to be determined. What I'll probably do is I'll pick a handful of causes that are meaningful to me and I'll put the specific charity or nonprofit up for a vote of my patrons on the Patreon site. And in the meantime, I highly recommend that you yourself get a blog or start creating your own YouTube content. Follow your passions, whatever they may be, and make your voice heard. Maybe someday, I'll become your patron. Now excuse me while I go back to building highway overpasses. <laughs>